I am uh, Chris Chrysostom, and I'm a senior software engineer for Medici Ventures. And uh, really fast, what does Medici Ventures care about uh, anything decentralized or whatever? Um, they really are interested in developing blockchain technologies, and one of them, one of the areas we want to focus on is uh, in, in property rights. So that's what my connection is to, to all of this. Um, anyway, I've been developing software for uh, a long time. Uh, we'll just leave it at that. And uh, sometime in 2012 is when I first was introduced to Bitcoin, and I essentially ignored it really for a couple years until I actually read the Satoshi white paper, and then then light <laughs> things started to click for me. Um, then during that time, I found uh, at the time it was called Florin Coin or Flow Blockchain, and uh, and the Alexandria project, uh, Devin and Amy here in uh, around 2016, and it's because I was motivated to, to build my own blockchain application, which at that time I was thinking, hey, it would be really cool if I re can publicly record um, bills, bills of sale. So whenever you have some, something that you care about that you wanted to sell, you want to make sure that transaction went right. Maybe you took lots of pictures, you took a video, you uh, had an audio file, you just want to put that up somewhere where you can find it later on and, and prove that some transaction actually happened. So that was uh, kind of my genesis for start, starting to think about things about how we can put important records into uh, a, a public space. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, that led me doing some development work for Alexandra, so that is why I became uh, uh, knowledgeable about Open Index Protocol. So uh, what's our problem? Uh, the problem I, I, I and Medici Ventures wanted to tackle is this issue of missing property rights. And for us here in the West and in Europe, it's kind of weird to think about not having property rights because everyone who owns a home probably knows they have a warranty deed to refer to or a title to re re refer to. And things seem pretty, pretty well structured on how we transfer property from one person to another because everyone talks about how when we go to closing and all that, there's all these documents we have to uh, show up with and a lot of things we need to sign. So that's true. In the West, things are pretty good in terms of uh, property recordation and everything associated with that. But, in the, but for the rest of the world, it turns out there's like five billion people who have no formal property rights. So what do I mean by that? Property, formal property rights means uh, exactly what I just described for us here in the West. Uh, so, so what that means is that the, you, have, you don't have a government or a legal system that actually recognizes what property is really owned by the individuals uh, on the ground. So when talking about this five billion people, I noticed, and Medici Ventures noticed, that uh, the dem demographic for those who don't have property rights or don't have formal property rights, it's really similar to the unbanked, which is a very interesting problem. And, and uh, probably many of you understand a little bit about how you know, the banking system really, it's, it's, it's really great for us in the West, um, but you take a look at other places, and I'll use Venezuela as an example, you know, money is really kind of a um, a, a difficult problem to solve for them, and, and they actually have turned to using cryptocurrencies uh, to exchange. So anyway, the point I'm trying to make here is it turns out that the unbanked has a very similar feel for, for those who also don't have formal property rights. Now, because the formal property rights may not exist for these five billion, it doesn't mean that there has been no agreement as to who owns what. Uh, what Medici Ventures has found that is it's that uh, there, there's this informal system that kind of grows from the grassroots. And when I say informal, I mean literally you, you'll have some designated person in a village with their pad and their pencil and they will write down their, uh, you know, the name of a fellow vi village member or, or, or a fellow uh, association member and they'll just record their name and, and write down what parcel, what we would consider a parcel, but what boundary of land they take care of. So I guess the point that we're trying to say is that this information actually is there, but the problem is it's not shared beyond that immediate localization. 
So what that has led to is this estimate that I have written up here that it's possible there's like $170 trillion worth of unrecognized property value just because someone recorded a property right on a yellow pad and stashed it on their shelf in their home. And what that means is uh, if I were to be a lender and I wanted to loan money against uh, a, a property, if I were local to where that yellow pad is with, that, with the pen pencil, I would probably trust what that pad says because I, I, I could see it for myself and be able to use that as collateral against any type of loan I, I have. But if we expand that out further and to like uh, a banking system like here in the West, um, they won't see that. that. That property is invisible. So that's kind of like the problem that, uh, uh, that uh, the project I'm working on wants to, to take a look at and, and solve. Um, so let me go over again what I meant by informal property records. So I kind of alluded to earlier where they're, they're held and frequently we'll find that they're held, these informal ledgers are held by like a ledger manager who really could be a representative of a, a community or a tribe or some local association. Uh, associations frequently are like uh, workers unions and agricultural co-ops and uh, things like that. And it's some sort of grassroots organization that, that has taken upon themselves to record what property claims exist for their local area. Um, turns out individuals actually um, kind of keep an informal accounting of who owns what. So that's why I put down here, it turns out uh, people's memory is an example of an informal property record, uh, family and neighbors. And, and also um, documentation that we don't count here in the West as real documentation for, for a, a property right or a claim. But that's why I put this bullet point up here about utility bills. Turns out there actually are uh, lenders in the developing world who will actually accept uh, a utility bill that has a name and some sort of address on it to demonstrate that, yeah, this person really lives where they say they live. So anyway, what does this all lead to? It all leads to what I like to call a social contract. And uh, this means there's, there's all kinds of agreements that takes place uh, informally that become social contracts. And then I, and what I'm trying to say by there is that in, in individual localities, uh, the social contract will have meaning to them, but it doesn't necessarily have meaning to us. So how do I make those social contracts uh, public for the rest of us to see? Um, so our solution, or proposed solution, and the thing that I'm, I'm working on, is let's put them somewhere where that's open, borderless, neutral, and censorship resistant. And for those of you who are interested or who follow Bitcoin, you probably have heard that those, those terms used quite frequently when, when talking about an open blockchain. And the reason why uh, I bring that up is that's what brought me to Open Index Protocol, because it actually provides a framework that gives, uh, gives us the ability to make a property record go into a, a system that's open, borderless, neutral, and censorship resistant. And um, I didn't really list out all the details as why that's so Im important, but just in, in a nutshell, and please hit me up afterward to ask more questions about this, but what we're going for, of course, is uh, we're trying to uh, elevate transparency and we want to prevent corruption of, of property records. And I, I throw that in there because um, in, 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 in many places around the world, uh, people's property uh, literally gets stolen because someone who's in the know can walk into an office where paper records are kept and they'll find the beachfront property that they're interested in and they'll pull up the title or the property record for that and t uh, pick it up for themselves, walk out of the office and, and throw it away and then come back a couple days later and say, hey, I'd like to make a claim for this beachfront property. So when the official goes to look up their paper record, it is not there anymore. So. Uh, the whole transparency and anti-corruption issue is, is, are two very important features that we're going for. So what did this require us to do? Um, 
we needed to work with uh, uh, the Alexandria team, Open Index Protocol, to define some property artifacts. Uh, Devin talked earlier that the, the, the object or the concept that's stored in o OIP uh, is an artifact. So we actually needed to have artifacts that represent uh, our data model for, uh, for defining a property right. And then this point on the right is a very interesting thing for us. Uh, I am from Medici Ventures, so we do care about the whole issue of payments and, and how, do you, how do you make money out of a, a system. What, one thing that I have really liked about Open Index Protocol is it provides what I call a multi-stakeholder incentive model for, for providing a way to distribute a payment to the various participants in the system. Now, wh who are the participants? Now, in our case, it's the property record only owner, and what I mean by the record owner, I mean it's, it's like the one who went through the trouble to gather the information together and create a property record and submit it into the system, the, kind of the uploader or, or publisher. Uh, and the second set of participants here, and you, know, you can ha see that I've listed a bunch of interested, interesting parties. Uh, which actually will end up playing the role of, uh, I, I would argue, the, the role of the influencer that Devin brought up uh, earlier in, in his talk. And that's going to be like the people like surveyors, lenders, banks, title insurance. A government actually may end up being uh, an influencer. Actually, a governor, government may actually end up being a publisher, another type of participant in the system. Uh, I threw in World Bank and NGOs and all that so on because it turns out for the rest of the world, uh, because of the issue of transparency and, uh, the, and, and a lot of countries want to prove that they have anti-corruption capabilities. Um, it ends up meaning like uh, uh, in, uh, large organizations like the World Bank like to monitor uh, property records and see, how, see what's going on with that. So they would be a participant in the system. So, and finally, point number three uh, is kind of an interesting one. For those people not familiar with cryptocurrencies, it may not make much sense. So I'll try my best to describe with that, that third set of uh, participant. Uh, I, one thing I liked about OIP, it finds a way to actually um, give a reward to those that secure the, the public ledger or the record system that we're using. You know, and in the Bitcoin space or, or the blockchain world, what I am talking about is the, the miners who, whose job it is to verify transactions and come to an agreement as to what transaction legitimately belongs in a blockchain. And so OIP actually provides uh, some additional incentive for, uh, uh, for those participants who are securing the network. Um, anyway. My thought, wouldn't it be cool if there was a developer that can come along and build the application that does all of this? And uh, um, now I, I'd say that uh, Medici Ventures is uh, definitely on a start, and we're in a moment, we're going to see a demo. But before I get launched into that, I want to show you our data model. This is really, this is simplified, but it's, it's, it's kind of the, uh, the, the basis for the social contract that I'm talking about in regards to uh, towards, uh, in regards to property. As you can see, I have a party and a spatial unit. And the party represents an individual or organization. Spatial unit represents some geographical information that represents boundary of, of the property you're talking about. And then this tenure thing in the middle is what connects the two together, and that's what provides the right responsibility or restriction um, in the property claim that we're trying to make here. So, we talk about ownership quite a lot about this, but I, I do need to point out this model actually provides for all kinds of ways of, of explaining or articulating a right. Uh, a right doesn't have to be ownership. Right could be like hunting rights. You know, uh, like, so this party could actually have a, a right to go hunting on a particular piece of land or to go fishing or extract minerals. Uh, it turns out in the developing world, mineral extraction is uh, a contentious issue. And, and there's all kinds of fights and all kinds of uh, money spent to kind of sort out who owns what and who has the right to dig through topsoil to get to, through, to minerals. So tenure doesn't have to mean just ownership. What I want to do is demonstrate uh, a quick 
simple application I threw together so you can see how this idea works. Um, so here you see I'm naming a party and we're kind of designating now what would be a, a spatial unit, a border for some property. Uh, you'll, you'll see I created a convoluted shape here, in the, the, but it's just, just to show that it doesn't have to be a rectangle. Um, but that string thing you did was really good. There you go, yeah. So um, of course you can name the property something useful. Uh, uh, wow, okay, I had a creative names here. This one's like called uh, Bosbian Bones, so I don't know where that came from, but, uh, <laughs> but the point is, is that the, a property can be named, so it can be searched. Uh, usually it's a parcel ID number, for example. There was a long description also uh, in there, and that was supposed to be like, surveyors usually have long descriptions of what, what the property boundary is here. Now this right here is demonstrating I can attach documents to these artifacts. And we've talked a lot about IPFS, and you're going to see IPFS again here in, in just a moment. Uh, what is going on here, we're publishing this information to the Flow blockchain. And over down here where it says blockchain status, you guys can't see it from there, but those are like transaction identifiers that represent the three pieces of the data model I, I showed before. So that's the transaction ID for uh, tenure. This one down here is the identifier for party. And the last one, it's uh, for the spatial unit. So I just wanted to highlight that, yeah, this really did get written to uh, the Flow blockchain. So here is some details on the transaction information. Um, it's just kind of showing you that this information is being pulled from a third-party API. This is not coming from Medici Ventures. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to click on this, and you can see some detail. Uh, it's going by fast, and anyone who wants to see more detail later, I can slow it down and show you. But down here, this flow data section, here is the JSON representation. Uh, let's see, in this case, it looks like the tenure, yeah, tenure object. And um, o over here is where we actually define that name, and there's an IPFS location address there, or I should say a content address that uh, we, can, we can invoke this. This is going to IPFS's gateway, by the way, just trying to show that, um, again, I went to a completely different piece of software. Uh, yeah, the, that's the map to sort of show uh, proof of location. <laughs> um, and uh, and I'm, I'm just clicking through here just to show you what these look like. This is yet another artifact. Uh, um, looks like it's for the party, yes. And so there's the name of the party that I put uh, put at the beginning, and then I'm going to do the same thing, looking at the location information, or I, I call it the spatial unit in the data model. And the important thing you see here, which is interesting, is that I have, it's, I think I'm going to highlight it here in a moment. You'll see a big long list of latitude, longitude, uh, and those are the, the coordinates that outline that polygon that I, I created. So the point about all this, this information now is now locked into an immutable, uh, uh, an immutable database or into a blockchain, which means now going forward, far in the future, if someone goes, wants to go back and see what record was there, they would be able to find it. 